you all for, for coming. It's very, very nice to know that people are interested enough to appreciate it enough to want to come and hear more about this work and my work and my father's work. Uh, it never had occurred to me uh, to show my paintings in, alongside my father's enamels. It just had never occurred to me. But when Susan came into the, my studio and was looking at my photography and everything, so they saw the paintings leaning up against the wall and said, well, what are these? And I said, well, these are a body of work I painted in the 1990s. He said, well, we'd like to show these. So I said, well, okay. I just never thought about putting them up alongside my father's enamels. And they said, well, well I think they'll go very well. And they actually do. I mean, I, I, I'm... And uh, I mean, I love the way they look. So I'm very pleased because I've been wanting to get back into painting and my photography has taken up a lot of my time. And uh, so this will probably inspire me to get back into painting. So uh, I was born in the East Coast in Brooklyn in 1953. Uh, three years after I was born, my parents moved to an artist community in Stony Point, New York, which is in Rockland County, which is on the north side of the city, or as opposed to Long Island, which is in the other direction. And it was an artist community uh, made up of people who were originally part of a, or, uh, a school called Black Mountain College in North Carolina. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Black Mountain College, um, but it's starting to get more notoriety. There's some major uh, exhibits that are gonna come out about the artists there. Uh, all kinds of interesting people. It was an enclave of what you could, I guess you could call the avant-garde the time and it ran for I want to say almost three decades and it closed in the early 50s and when it closed its doors uh, a lot of folks moved to New York where the art scene was happening the New York art scene was starting to really thrive and so uh, the community was uh, I grew up on was the land was purchased by an architect who was helping to keep Black Mountain alive financially towards the end of his days and he uh, designed the homes that we built and my family built the second home on the property it was 116 acres on the side of a mountain with a waterfall running down through the, the granite boulders. It was a beautiful place to grow up. And um, so I, uh, <clears throat> my family moved there, and uh, there was musicians, there was uh, uh, filmmakers, experimental filmmakers, there was uh, uh, ceramicists. In fact, this woman here wrote this book, it's called Centering, M.C. Richards, Mary Caroline Richards, she was a poet, an author, and she was a well-known ceramicist, and when I was about eight years old, she told me how to, taught me how to center pottery on a wheel, which I haven't done since. <laughs> I like making sculptures, so I made a little dinosaur one time, and M.C. calls up and says, Lawrence, come down here right away. I came all the way down the hill, and I said, what she got, she got a pony for me? You know, I was a little kid, and I got that she was really mad because my dinosaur exploded in the kiln and put shards of, of, uh, of uh, pottery onto her pots, which she was you know, firing at the same time, unfortunately. But anyway, so I grew up in that environment, um, <clears throat> and I never was formally trained in art. I actually moved out of my parents' house when I was 16 years old, and I moved to the West Coast when I was 18, 19, and uh, so I never really got a chance to uh, be taught art by my father, uh, or to go to art school or anything like that. So I was pretty much self-taught, but obviously I grew up around some of the most famous uh, artists of the New York art scene of the, of the, of the, of the world of modern art. And, um, and so some of it obviously crept into my psyche somehow. <laughs> and uh, I mean, uh, just to give you some stories which I recant, recount sometimes um, uh, when I was I think I was about 12 years old, I was in the Cedar Tavern with my mother, who, uh, Cedar Tavern was the famous place where all the modern artists hung out and got drunk all day. And uh, I was sitting at the table with uh, Willem de Kooning. And he's a very famous painter, probably one of America's most famous painters and, uh, of modern art. <clears throat> and uh, he was sitting there drinking his beer and stuff, and I was sitting there with my mom, and he said, hey Lawrence, why don't you help me clean up in my studio? And I, I was a smart ass, you know, I didn't put up with anything. These guys were just a bunch of drunks to me. I didn't know who they were. You know, I said, well, sure, how much you paying? You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> do it for the money, you know. Of course, any painting out of the garbage would put both my kids through college. Um, so he got mad and ended up throwing a beer can at me because my mom dragged me out of the bar. But I mean, I'd go to the, all these taverns, the Mickey's, uh, Max's Kansas City was another haunt where the, where the artists would go. Uh, Mac, uh, Mickey always had a spread out for the artists, you know, the food every night. So the artists would go and 
eat, eat the food and, and hang out. And so I would go there. Or the Ninth Circle, which was a place that had peanuts, there were peanut shells on the entire floor. As a kid, I mean, it was just amazing to go to these places, you know. And, uh, you know, my parents would take me to the shows of the Whitney and the Guggenheim, and I would go into, and there'd be a room there with uh, wood milk crates all around the wall, like this. And I go, what the hell is this? They say, well, it was conceptual art. I said, yeah, it's conceptual crap. You know, again, I was a loud mouth little kid, and I didn't hold my feelings back too, 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 uh, too easily. And so, but anyway, I was exposed to all this. <clears throat> so somehow I got into, into my work. <clears throat> so I, um, I didn't start painting until I was in my 40s. And it wasn't really my parents' work that inspired me to paint, but it was a painter out of Santa Fe named uh, Don Faberkamp, who I had become friends with. And Don was uh, busy collecting tribal art at the time, which I was a tribal art dealer for 30 plus years. And uh, so I was really enamored with his paintings and I started trading tribal art for his work. And I ended up with probably about 15 of his major works towards the end of his life because he had just uh, finished building a studio and went to bed and died in his sleep at 60 years old. So I have probably the best work of his life as far as uh, abstract art. But just to put a funny note on that, Don could render, like my father can render, like this is a Mona Lisa version of his Mona Lisa. He could render, he was an artist. And Don could as well. And he used to put down uh, abstract art when he lived on the East Coast, when he went to Cooper Union School. And uh, he said, he, until he went, to, I don't know if it was the Guggen or the Whitney, but he saw a show by, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, what's his name? Ah, will come to me in a minute. But it was, he was so, taken by the show that he had to keep sneaking back in the museum to see it because he had been so outspoken against abstract art. He didn't want any of his friends to see that he was going to see this uh, Shield Gorky show. That's what it was, the Shield Gorky. And you can see Gorky's, if you know his work, and if you look it up, you'll see that you'll, when you look at Don Fabrican's work, you say, oh my God, you can see the influence. So living with Don's paintings is when I started to kind of be interested in painting. And so you can see it because you can't see Don's work here because I don't have a, a slideshow, but if you were to look at his paintings, you would see in my work some of the, his influence there. So, um, anyway, that's, is anybody got questions about my work? Because I'll move on to my father's if you, if, uh, if not, because, uh, okay, so, so <clears throat> my father uh, was born in Oakland, California in 1926. And he went to the University of California, Southern California, for a school. It was a, it was a art, special arts school division that he went to, uh, the Roski School of Design, I think it's called. And uh, from there, he went uh, straight down into uh, Mexico City to go to the, uh, the Polytech Institute there and studied with uh, a fellow named Gutierrez. And uh, not only did he study the tempera painting and all the traditional types of painting, but they were experimenting with the very first acrylic paints. They were designing, they were working with DuPont and another company, and they were working with these paints for the first time. So my father got a chance at 19 years old to, to actually use these materials before they were, the public had access to them. And uh, there he told me he got to study with two of his uh, childhood heroes, Tamayo and um, Sequeiras. These were very famous Mexican artists, uh, and they were all part of what they called the muralistas because they're all interested in these outdoor murals. And so my father was also interested in that. And of course, they were looking for a medium that would survive the, the, the elements. So uh, this is what the acrylic paints were all about. And so from there, he went back to California and then shortly thereafter moved to New York where he actually drove his brother there who was doing well with his work. He was also a painter. And um, <clears throat> uh, he met my mother shortly thereafter. They got married very soon after that. And um, <clears throat> he got hired by the Brooklyn Museum School to teach painting, to teach design, and to develop an enamel, uh, uh, enameling uh, department, which they were very interested in. And this is where my father started to learn about enamels. And what they did uh, is they, they created, at that time, my father did a line of commercial works. There were little compacts like these here. Um, he made cigarette cases, little ashtrays, and these are made with stencils. And you can see in this enameling book, this is actually my mother helping in the, in the studio there. And this is the, the actual stencil that my father was making that made this 
very piece right here, right? And so they estimated that they made something like 45,000 little objects like this during the period of that time. And, uh, and they continued to make them until the fellow that was distributing them to high-end department stores in New York City and stuff basically stole all my father's designs and had them made in Europe and stopped sending checks to my folks. So that was an education into the art world for them for sure. But that is when my father started to expand on the idea of making larger pieces and making his abstract works into, into larger pieces. And so it kind of, I guess it was kind of pushed him out the, the door, so to speak, into that world. And um, from that period, the very first outdoor mural he did, it's not really a mural, but it was the side of an escalator in Bush Gardens in Florida. Uh, for the for Anheuser Busch, it was the world's largest escalator at the time. It was outdoors, and he did a series of colored blue panels that ran, ran down the side of the escalator. And so then he uh, ended up doing things like these doors for the Judson Memorial Theater in New York. These are very tall doors, and like the you have the frowning and the smiling in the theater. Well, this was a theater, so he had the, the one side was more black and the other side was more white. It was kind of very cool. I've been looking for these, I don't know what happened to them, but so far I've not been able to find them. <clears throat> so he did those, he did the, the doors to the Martha Jackson Gallery, which she, she was one of the premier galleries in modern art. She handled my father's brother John's abstract works. Um, and one of the things that happened to my father often, which was the bane of his existence, was that he would, uh, he would often get mixed up with his brother because his brother was actually more famous as a painter. <clears throat> so this is a work my father did <clears throat> for the Johnson Wax, Wax Company. And Johnson Wax uh, did a seminal exhibit. It was actually the my father's agent, the Lee Nordness, uh, put this together. It was a major, major show. It was called Objects USA. This was a seminal exhibit in the world of craft and, and art fine art and craft. Now, at the time, there was always this age-old argument, and it still happens in the world of art and craft, of what is craft and what is fine art. And so this has always been an argument. And uh, <clears throat> of course, this could be considered craft, right? And which enameling is normally considered craft. Even jewelers, you know, the poisoning, little, little, little jewel-like works are considered craft. But this show had something like 300 some odd artists, this Objects USA, and the Smithsonian it started out the Smithsonian and traveled all over for several years. And it was a seminal exhibit. I mean, it was groundbreaking because it really blurred the line between craft and fine art for the first time. And so the, it's, what's amazing about it is that out of this, this piece, out of the 300 some odd pieces on the show, Johnson Wax only kept my father's and two other pieces out of the entire collection. The rest were all dispersed into museums. So it hangs today in their uh, their, their offices in Racine, Racine, Wisconsin, which is a Frank, Frank Lloyd Wright building. So, um, <clears throat> Lawrence, what year would that have been that exhibition? Uh, uh, object USA. Object USA is 1960. I should say right here. I should know that off, head, off my head, but I'm not too good with dates, as Lynn will tell you. Um, I, should have, I should have a publishing date. I think it was. I think it was a 68 or something. Well, the book is 1970, so I think it was 1968. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I saw that. What's that? I was looking on the East Coast. Oh, you saw the show? Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was the year I graduated from high school, 1969. Where did you see it? At the Smithsonian. At the Smithsonian. That's yeah. awesome. Wow. I wish I could have seen it. That's very cool. That's yeah. Amazing. My father's work was also shown at the World's Fair in New York, and the World's Fair, there was one on the West Coast also, it was shown in both of those World's Fairs. So, um, he's, he also started doing pieces on steel, which we don't have any examples in the show, but uh, you can see these are, this is on steel. This was made in the 50s, which is pretty advanced for, you know, at that time for, for abstraction. It's another one from the 50s. Uh, and then, this is a beautiful piece here. My friend of mine bought this. Anyway, the, <clears throat> I, I, uh, okay. Uh, there's a lot going on. <laughs> 
so um, <clears throat> my father had kind of started backing off of making enamels, I guess in the 1970s was the last large body of work, which included this piece here. He did a show in Albany, uh, which had, a, had a, quite a large collection of his work. And that was one of the pieces in that show, the Albany collection. Do you, I asked just a question. Yeah. Uh, do you know where he would have these fire? Did he have his own? Good question, I'm glad, because that was something I was going to talk about. So oh, good. Hi. All right, so as most people know, uh, enameling is usually done in small kilns. Yeah. The largest enameling kiln you can buy, I think, is 55 inches, and that's nowadays. He didn't have them back then, right? So my father designed a contraption that he invented so he could open air fire. This is three panels, you see here? Uh -huh. It's panel one, two, and three. And so he would take, uh, before it was fired, he would you know, do whatever he was gonna do, and then he'd take the, the piece of copper, and he had uh, a contraption that was on like a track, like a train. And, uh, and there was two angle irons on the top that was part of the frame that had these uh, strong, thin steel bars that went across that could be slid along the angle irons. And he would set the angle irons up, like maybe three or four of them for a piece like this. And then he would lay that on those, uh, on those uh, thin rods that would be held up by the angle iron. And then he had this cart that ran on a track underneath it. And the cart had two large propane tanks and then a row of protein, uh, propane nozzles that he could light as many of or open up as, and light as many as he wanted for the size of the, of the panel. Right? And then he had, a, I remember he had a crank like this that would bring it down the uh, track, and then it had like uh, inner tube tire rubber things holding it in so he could go back and forth like this, but it wouldn't like bump into it. So it was really, I mean, he was an inventor. My father was an inventor more than anything else. And so he would uh, light those butane torches, uh, propane torches, and then he would slowly bring it underneath, rocking it back and forth underneath the, the, that, the panel that he was firing until it got cherry red, which is about a 1500 degrees has to be in order to melt the glass, to fuse the glass. And he would just ride it along until he got the whole thing fired. And then he would take a, these prongs and open it and put it on a, on a big piece of, I think, not masonite, maybe masonite, I can't remember the material. And he'd roll it out flat, because while it was still warm, he'd roll it out flat. And then he would fire the next one. And then of course, he'd make these patterns so they'd run into each other so he could make a large piece. So nobody else has ever done this, I mean, that I know of. Um, <clears throat> other people have used torches, you know, like just on a single torch on a piece like that. So <clears throat> he ended up giving that contraption to Penland School of Design in North Carolina, where he, he taught one summer. I went down there with him as a kid. And uh, they used it for several years. And, um, and then I guess they got rid of it eventually because it was an old, I think it's made out of plywood. <laughs> No, it's kind of an old thing. So anyway, he invented it. <clears throat> Nobody else ever had ever done that before. So, um, any other questions about that? So this is heated in an open room. Yeah, an open room. And they got that hot from a t from torch spot. Yeah, just from the spot torches. You'd see it get cherry red. I'd watch, in fact, there's a film. There's a 13 minute film. It's an award winning film. You can see it online if you just <coughs> look up my father's name, Paul Holberg, and Reflections. It's, black and, it's not black and white, but it's... It is in black and white, yes. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. I, I, I have seen it that. It shows the contraption, it shows okay. him firing it, and you can cool. see the whole thing, and he explains his process, his creative process. And it's a great little film. I'm so glad we have it, because it's got my father's voice. Which is not unlike your voice. <laughs> is it? I mean, when I was listening to it, I could hear you. Okay. okay, nice. Very nice. So, um, yeah, so my father, <clears throat> in the... 1980s, <clears throat> the owner of Metro Media, uh, John Klug, uh, commissioned my father to do a large enamel on steel uh, installation for the Metro Media building in New York. Now, um, <clears throat> apparently he had uh, collected some of my father's early works, including something called a lumen flinger, which this is my father's sense of humor. It's my father invented a box that kind of st stood cattywampus and that had uh, something, a projector on the inside that projected uh, cellophane that were sandwiched between polarized lenses. And the contraption would move like this, because as you move the polarized lenses, 
it would change the colors of the folded cellophane in between them. And then it would project it on all sides of this box. He, had, he got a grant, a major grant, for making this thing, and he, uh, I think he made three of them, and apparently John Kluge had one of them. I don't know how he got it or how, where it ended up. I have no idea. But he commissioned my father to make what was a major, major installation of his work. <clears throat> this here. Wow. Mm. So these are four foot panels. Each one's four feet. This runs 60 feet. And this was uh, down in where the guests to Metro Media were coming to meet with John Kluge, drive through. And Moreau's last commission hung right next to it. Is that the enamel? This is enamel on steel, mm. rather than copper. Do you know how he got fire view? I'm sorry, what? Do you know how he fired Yes, he, he revamped a, uh, a company in Texas that uh, normally would, would be enamel refrigerators. Oh, okay. And they set it up to, to do these, and of course now they're doing this for other people as well. So, um, Where yeah. is that now? Where is that today? I own it. Where? I own it. Oh, wow. Yeah, because uh, by the time he got it finished, I mean, I think he paid something like $180,000 for this back then, which was a significant wow. chunk of change. But by the time he got it finished, John Kluge was done with Vetra Media. He was selling off the property. All the artwork was, got dispersed. And my father got a call one day from a, from a salvage company in Florida saying, uh, Mr. Holper, uh, we have this body of work here that was given to us for salvage, but we thought you might want to have it back. Mm. So he got it back for the price of shipping it back from Florida back to New York, and I, I now own it. It's in New York. It's in storage. Unfortunately, they took it off the walls with crowbars and stuff and chipped oh, all the no. edges, and it was, so it needs major work. But during the time he did this, he also made other individual pieces, like this one here. And so these are all been sh have been shown in different shows from the books and stuff. So <clears throat> anyway, so that was the last enamel that my father had made. And he'd already kind of pretty, pretty much retired from enameling 15 years prior to that. So um, he's come out of basically enamel retirement to make that body of work. It was kind of significant. But my father went on to do go back to painting. He was really a printmaker originally, and uh, the Museum of Modern Art in New York has two of his prints in the permanent collection. And uh, and he experimented with every kind of printing. I mean, he, I mean, he would print with a potato. I mean, he he, he printed with anything. And when he taught uh, printing in uh, college, he was a professor. He he taught everything from the printing presses to the every you know screen printing, you name it. He taught taught all different types of. And uh, he went back into painting, and he painted a series of landscapes, most of which sold very quickly. Uh, then, uh, but actually, before the landscapes, he painted these large, uh, like six and seven and eight foot canvases, close ups of friends of the family. And um, they were uh, very impressive, actually. But, you know, not, not commercially saleable, because who wants to have a gigantic close up of a stranger on their wall? And this is give you an idea. This is one of those paintings. This is seven feet, this painting here. And this was of the postmaster, our local postmaster in Pomona, who was also a painter and a friend of the family. But I mean, you can see that he was a master of light and shadow and brushstroke. I and mean, he was just pretty amazing. Is that acrylic? That's acrylic, yeah. He, he painted mostly with acrylic. What happened to that collection? That painting, we, we have those paintings, yeah. The whole set? Uh, uh, pretty much, yeah. We have pretty much. He only painted maybe a dozen of those, and um, he was in a show with some pretty famous artists. I mean, I think De Kooning was in the show as well. It was a group show, and instead of putting in enamel, he put in one of these, and it was a it was an eight foot painting of you know, a friend of theirs smoking a cigarette and a cigarette dangling in his mouth. And the New York Times mentioned it in a, when they were reviewing the show. They said, "Well, those who." No, Paul Hoberg's work, you're going to be kind of surprised when they come and they see this large canvas of a man smoking a cigarette. <laughs> you know? So, um, but I was going to go back to one of the things that my father had a problem with was being compared to his brother. So this has my father's work. This is a page dedicated to my father in this show that was Objects USA. And in the index, it has my father's name. But here it has John Hoberg, his brother. Hmm. Uh, this hurt my father, I can't tell you how much it hurt him. Sure. And this happened multiple times. 
multiple times. Was John an artist? With John, and confused with his brother John. But was he the, the brother of an artist also? Oh yeah, he, he was more famous as an abstract oh. painter. My father, John, was with the Martha Jackson Gallery. He's, his, his, if you do a search on him, you'll see his paintings selling on eBay, oh. stuff like that. Were they close? No, no, there were some family issues that separated them. Was the work close? Huh? Was the work close? Did you know? Oh, was the work close? No, I was curious about their relationship. Yeah, yeah. no, they, they, they were... one way or the other, the brothers. I they had a strange them. relationship. Yeah. And so did he with his children. My, my mother had uh, him meet his children for the first time uh, when they were teenagers. And so they, she, she was always trying to bring family together. Yeah, so they didn't, yeah, they, I did unfortunately, because I love my uncle's paintings, and, but I, I couldn't really bring that into the house. I owned a couple of them. One of them, actually, 19, 1954, a large canvas. And um, my grandmother had a couple of small ones, and I got her to give them to me to say I could have them before she died. But uh, you can see, my, when you go to do searches, you'll see a lot more of my Uncle John's work than my father's, which I'm changing that, because I was committed when I, uh, my parents moved to the south of France in their 80s, okay, which was 15 years ago. Um, <clears throat> my mom's now 93. Uh, they they um, pretty much just up and left everything, and they had two, two studios on the property. They had a gallery, which they had run. My parents run their own gallery. They didn't want to deal with the, the art scene. So my father became an art professor, and they had their own gallery. They showed their work, and they showed work of their friends. And they had many articles written by local people who, were, who they knew, who wrote articles in the local papers and stuff. But they weren't really moved to try to make it in the art scene in New York City. My, my father just didn't like that whole scene. He didn't want to be part of it. He didn't want to be dragged to those open you know, shows and stuff. It just wasn't in, in his interest. He was kind of more of a recluse and a bit of a drinker himself at the time, which he gave up, thank, thankfully. And so... <clears throat> So you got, when they left for yeah. the south of France, oh. you left all of Okay, so I went back, uh, no, it was just my parents moved there. My youngest brother already lived in France, so he was there, and he moved from Paris down to the south to be with them, to help them transition. And he lives in Montpellier now. And so, at the time though, so they didn't know what to do with the property in New York because the market had crashed. It was right during the decline of the market, and they couldn't sell it. So I committed to moving back there and to organizing all their stuff and cleaning up the mess and getting the house uh, prepared to sell. It took me three and a half years to sell the house. I had no idea. So, of course, I found the body of work of my father's, which I'd always admired, and um, some of it was in the garage and was being weather-worn, and uh, most of it was coming apart because my father used contact cement to glue the, these sheets onto plywood which had about a 25 year lifespan. So these are all 60 plus years old. And so these would start to come apart. So I would have to carefully take them completely apart and remove all the oxidation and glue off the back of the copper and bring it, remove it all from the wood and bring them back to bare wood and bare copper before re gluing these back together. So it's not restoration, it's really conservation, but it kind of looks like restoration when you're in it. And uh, it was quite a job. I, I, I took a, I did a body of work for a show in Philadelphia. It took me three years to prepare that body of work. And so <clears throat> it's been a labor of love, uh, bringing my father's work, uh, you know, that had been kind of gone into obscurity, and bringing it back into the the eyes of the public. And and, and now some museums have picked up on them. Now uh, museums have started to pick up on them, uh, and so we now we got some in, in major museums. The Enamel Arts Foundation, which was a, a, a couple of uh, uh, very fine gentlemen who uh, had a very large enamel collection, had collected my father's work, and they had uh, they did a show, a major show. Unfortunately, they didn't know my father was still alive, which was too bad because I mean, even though they had a page in the book and they mentioned my father, he wasn't in that particular show. They did a following show following that, another major book uh, on enameling. That, uh, were, but they did include my father, and it was a traveling show around the United States. And uh, <clears throat> they have now been donating their collection of tens of, I mean, a lot of pieces. They have thousands of pieces. And they've been donating to major museums in the United States, <clears throat> including some of my father's work, and I've also been donating to, to fill out the collection so the museums could have pieces of my father's. 
So that was really my goal, to, to really get the work where it could be seen by the, by the public, where it wasn't just sitting in a garage or my father's studio. And so that's the process we're in, and, and that's what we're doing here. And I'm so glad that Susan wanted to do the show here. And, um, and uh, uh, it's just, uh, I think it looks wonderful. And, and uh, I'm very happy and I'm honored to have my, my work shown alongside my father's. Yeah. So, uh, anyways, just, so these are, <clears throat> in addition to these abstractions that my father did, which you can see is kind of splattered and I mean, sometimes he was compared to, uh, to you know, uh, Jackson Pollock. But he also did works where he would draw. This, I think this is called Scrofito, scrif I think it's called, where you, you can actually draw and create, uh, you know, pictures. Like, he did a, many faces where this was drawn freehand. But he also was a stencil maker, so he would make stencils. And... Uh, you know, similar to those little pieces. And so this is a stencil he made. Now this was just from an advertisement in the New York Times that he would just start to darken and create light and shadow. So, uh, and then you could see that, that it could be reversed and he could use different colors to accent the piece in different ways. So once you have a stencil, you can make, make it any color and you know, do anything you want with it. So that was another body of work which I haven't really exposed yet, the, the, the whole stencils. You did some of other artists, portraits of other artists in that stencil design. That's the one he did with the Mona Lisa. <laughs> Do you have a plan for those in the future? Say again? Do you have a plan for the stenciling in the future? As like a future show with the stencils? Yeah, yeah. I, I, it will probably happen with a retrospective show once I get a, a major museum to want to do a retrospective. It will probably be included in the retrospective. Now, I do have some pieces from the 50s. Uh, that first uh, show that he did, it was a major exhibit. Uh, and my father's pieces were like prime in that exhibit. It was the, put, off by, put on by the uh, Craft, uh, Craft Council of New York, I think it was called. Anyway, this is from that period. This is from the 50s, this period. And it was, uh, you can see he used very, very little color at the time. He used uh, the, what's called fire scale which is what happens to the, the copper and, and when it's heated and uh, along. So he would use black, white, and then the coppery color. And he did large, and he did some, he did some really large pieces. In fact, when he made it, he had some life-size screens, they're really tall, and they would open up like this. And so there'd be a panel here, a panel here, a panel here, and uh, there'd be that, this kind of design that I was just showing you in these large screens. I have a few of them. Uh, I'm trying to restore a couple of them. There, it's a it's a big process. I may have to replace the screen part. I may take some and not put them in the screens or put them on panels on the wall. I haven't decided how I'm going to work with that yet because they they need actually restoration. Some of them because they got water damaged. So that's uh, that's beyond my expertise. Uh, I, in fact, I couldn't even find anybody to do what I was doing with these. And if I did, I wouldn't have been able to afford it because it was too much work. So I just had to figure out how to do it myself. So that's that's where we're at. But um, any other questions? Do you yeah. have a favorite work that's on exhibit now of your father's? Of uh, my father's, mm -hmm. I would say that little piece that's on the entryway here that you guys come here. Mm -hmm. We couldn't really find a place in the exhibit once we put it everything together. We didn't really have a place for it. But uh, you guys hung it there for the show. That's one of my favorite pieces. Uh, this one here, that's framed here. I had never seen it before because uh, there were some panels that had never been mounted that were kind of stacked together and, uh, you know, that had taped around them, you know, just in storage, you know. And so when I opened that up, I was like, whoa, I've never seen it. I've never even seen those colors and work in those colors like that. And um, it had some oxidation and stuff, so I had to be very careful with steel wool and use a little wax to bring it out so it wouldn't, wasn't any longer, didn't have the kind of stuff that was blocking the, the, the image itself. So yeah, I would say that was some of my favorite. But I mean, once you start looking at them all, I mean, I love them all, That's which is kind of a problem because they're for sale, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a large art collection besides my parents' work and my own work. I have, you know, I had an art gallery for years and so I have a pretty large art collection. We don't have room for everything. I mean, my studio's filled, my, the house is filled, and there's stuff stacked in, in rooms, you know. Uh, but I love art, and so I'm a patient.
patron as well as a creator. Yeah. I'm just so happy that you're here and that you were able to lend this museum quality work to the gallery. Yes. Yeah. It, yes. It's really superb. Well, the, it looks good in the gallery too, so it looks like a museum quality show. Yeah. So that's it works both ways. Appreciate it. Yeah. Lars, I'm curious yes. about your work. Yes. Can you just give us a few words? Yeah. About that? So. Um, as I said, I didn't really start painting until I started living with the paintings of Don Fabricant, which he had all this textures going on. And I was trying to emulate these, where when you see a color, it's not just a color, but it has all these other textures and colors going, kind of impressionistic in a way, going on within, within those colors. The challenge I have is that when I painted, I would paint on the floor, on paper, and I like paper because it absorbs paint and all the different mediums I'm using, it kind of just, it's more thirsty than canvas. Canvas is more difficult for me, and untrained, so canvas is just more difficult to work with for me. I've done a few, but not enough. So, but I do it on the floor, and I'd always be turning them, and I'd turn it this way, and I'd do some more, and I'd turn it that way, and I'd turn it this way. And by the time I got done, I couldn't figure out which side was gonna be up or which side was down. Now, you can often say, oh, abstract art doesn't matter, but you know, it kind of really does sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't, but sometimes it does. It needs a foundation, it needs to, you know, structure, kind of like, more like this one here, which is called, whoops, sorry, which is called edifice, you see, it has some structure, you see, and this one's called Krakatoa, it's like a volcano, so it has a little bit of structure, but what I would find is, I was, what I was lacking in my work was, I get so enamored with the textures and the colors and the things going on, I forget about what the, well, what's the design, what's the, What's the end goal of this painting? And it would just happen spontaneously. I wouldn't like draw it out and then fill it in, although I have done that sometimes. It's mostly just, I just start pushing paint around and then just start adding layers. And, and so I would say my, the, the, the challenge I have is composition. So I'd like to work on that more and as I go into the future of my painting, to kind of come up with a more uh, concrete composition in my work, if that makes sense. How long have you been painting? I've only been painting since, uh, uh, well, my 40s, and I'm 70, 40, so about 30 years, I guess. Yeah, um, but uh, when I did this body of work in the 90s, I was really painting. I, was, I have drawers of these, drawers of them, and most of them were experiments, because I'm just learning, teaching myself how to use the materials. And so, and there's some that I didn't like at all, the composition, but when I cut them up into smaller pieces, I kind of liked the, the small, Parts like so I like that part of the painting, so I like, okay, that's it, that's good, you know. So composition is that's my challenge, and so uh, we'll see how that goes into the future. Yeah. Yes. What paper versus canvas? What yeah. About what kind of paint do you like? What's your I use acrylic. I like the the fastness. That uh, in fact, I'll even have a hair dryer sometimes because I want to do layers. Mm -hmm. So I want the layer to dry out, so I do another layer. Now sometimes you layer when it's wet because you want that mixture but sometimes you want to dry, so I'd have a hair dryer there and try it out. So I like work fast. I like working fast, and so I get impatient. And so I just, you know, I want it to keep, you know, keep, keep moving with it. Otherwise, I'll just move on to something else. And usually I'm doing four or five at a time because as I'm cleaning my brushes, I'll scribble it on a blank, and that would be the start of another painting. <laughs> and you have a color mix that you like as well, so you just keep going. Yeah, I mean, you'll find like a lot of these in this body of work are a similar palette. Um, like, uh, uh, and so, you know, I mean, the two there are different, you know, because they, they're, they're similar, but they're different from the rest. But uh, you'll find that many of these and the ones around here, they're all kind of a similar palette. So I have others that have done different palettes ex that I've experimented with, mostly, you know, we're more blue or more, you know. But uh, that, it's wide open, man. Who knows what's going to come next? Yes. With your, your dad and your uncle being artists, do you know if it went back another generation to their grandparents? Or no. No. Not it, that I know. Is talent began with? Yes. Them? Yeah. Oh. Both, both of them. What uh, did your parents do? Uh, my, uh, you know, I never met my father's uh, side. Uh, he, he had passed away before I was born, and uh, but uh, when my, my father's mother died when he was. 12, I think he was 12, which was pretty devastating for my father. 
and um, the family was divided up. There was uh, four siblings, and the, the the two older brothers, John and my father, went to stay with uh, relatives in Fresno. He went to Fresno High School, and um, the other two uh, stayed somewhere else. The sister and and uh, but. One thing that my grandfather encouraged them to do was to write to each other daily. And so they said, well, is it okay if we draw pictures? Not, not just write, they said yes. So they got into like drawing all these cartoons back and forth, and I have some of these as, you know, in, in my archives. And so they would draw these amazing like cartoons, and they were, both were pretty good at cartooning, I gotta say, you know. I, I was always impressed with my father's cartooning. One of the things I delighted doing with my father is uh, he would, uh, you know, um, the show that they did at uh, Untitled, The uh, Exquisite Corpse. So he, my father would fold a piece of paper in three and, you know, we, somebody would do the head and then make the neck go into the next piece. You turn it over, you don't look at the head, and you do the body, and then you put the extensions for the legs and you turn that over and you do the legs. Well, he, we would do that with, with my father, but of course, we always wanted him to draw because he would draw these amazing things, you know, and um, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, my father, uh, my mom was 50, my father started to teach her how to paint. Mm -hmm. And um, she pretty much took over, <laughs> I got to say. Uh, all the art changed in the house. Uh, it was no longer my father's works and now my mother's paintings. Mm -hmm. And she did some pretty impressive work. I have to say, she, she really learned painting. Uh, and her works are so layered. And she did abstractions, she did a body of uh, political works that were based on AP wire surface photos uh, that were very, very strong. She did some portraits. She did some beautiful large canvases of flowers and of animals. Uh, very, pretty impressive actually. And she's still working. She can't paint anymore. She's almost blind. But she's cutting out uh, colored construction paper and making these uh, collages with them where they just cut out pieces of paper and they're wonderful. We're having a series of them printed now. She wants to for those and um, she she uh, my mother taught a, a class at Parsons School of Design uh, called the visual arts as a profession and uh, she every other class she would teach both uh, every other class and every other class she'd have a guest so she had John Cage come who's a good friend of the family's so John Cage came one of the classes Yoko Ono was one of the guest uh, people at the, uh, one of her classes very popular uh, class it was so popular the dean of the college took it over. <laughs> um, and so she, that, she no longer worked there. She also did a radio show. She used to call in, there was a call in radio show that she used to really enjoy. And uh, eventually they invited her to come and be the host of the show. So she did that for a while. Uh, but she was uh, mostly, a, you know, a wife and more of a wife than a mother. She, my mother wasn't very motherly. <laughs> she was into their own, they were into their own world. You know, and then uh, we were just happy to be their kids, and you know, she, they needed somebody to clean the house. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm being a little bit mean to my mom, but you know, <laughs> she's super creative, and the fact that she's still cranking out artwork at 93 years old is pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. And uh, she has a very popular Facebook following, more so than me, and uh, and she'll put out uh, sometimes musings, you know, where she writes about what's going on in the little village. She lives in a little village in the south of France called Sauve. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know Zap Comics, but, um, but uh, R. Crumb, Robert Crumb, lives in the village. Probably one of America's greatest renderers, uh, you know, ever. I mean, he's just uncanny. And uh, his wife, unfortunately, I, Aileen, just passed away recently, but he was directly behind my mother in this little village and their friends. And the village has got less than 2,000 people, and but uh, 28 nationalities. So there's people from all over the world have a little home in Sov where they, they'll go to a different place. A lot of Europeans live there, full of artists and musicians, and it's just a great little place for them to have landed for the last 15 years of my father's life, or the last 12 years of my father's life. Where are you all from? Huh? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Like, uh, you I grew up in New York. Okay. Uh, my my uh, father was born in California, my mother was born in New Jersey, and I was born in Brooklyn. And we grew up in upstate New York, just a little ways north of the city. 
How did you end up here in Oklahoma? My partner Lynn, right here, okay. is shooting a video right now. She was born and raised here, uh, has, comes from a family of doctors. Her father was an anesthesiologist, and her uncle was a well known pediatrician. They named a building after him, Garrison. And um, so we had met in California 25 years ago. Something like that. I keep saying 20, but I say that for the last five years. Probably. <laughs> and so uh, uh, we met in California, and we, we became partners then. And, Sometimes we lived on two coasts because I had to go back to New York. We finally moved her to New York after being there for several years. The house sold three months after we finally moved her to New York after living on two coasts for three years. And then uh, we rented a home in Nyack and lived there for a couple of years. And then uh, her mom got sick and passed away. Well, we were here with her, but we were still living in New York. And her father got sick, so Lynn wanted to be back here with her family. She has sisters and siblings here. So we moved back here. Well, she moved here first. I was still in New York handling everything there, and then uh, I finally moved here. So it's been about five or six years I've been here now. What were your impressions of Oklahoma City when you first moved here? Well, I've been coming here for a dozen years before right. moving here, and so I had impressions before that. And um, I thought, wow, this is a sleepy place. <laughs> you know, it's not, I mean, I'm used to San Francisco and, uh, and also uh, New York, and so I'm used to a lot of traffic, a lot of commotion, a lot of, you know, uh, urban sprawl and you know and so when I moved here I said wow then you can get from one side of the city to the other in 10-15 minutes it's like you know it's not a big deal that's changing uh, there's more traffic here now there's more people moving here the infrastructure is growing um, but I love it here the people are so friendly and uh, I just and everybody's an artist I was shocked I mean Everybody, you wouldn't expect it. And it, it turned out to be an artist. I mean, a lot of artists and a lot of musicians, a lot of great singer songwriters. Mm -hmm. And I'm a musician as well. So, I mean, I really appreciate that part of it. Yeah, so I really like it here. I mean, I mean we bought a home here now, and mm -hmm. you know, we're here. And, you know, it's a great place yeah. to live. Yeah. Lance, I like the idea, or I have this idea that your father's work is, there's still a mystery about it. and and there's still art to be found, that it's in someone's home or... Oh, yeah. You know, there's still more of his art out there. Yeah, in fact, uh, since we've started uh, making it more public again, people have kind of come out of the woodwork with pieces. People have sent me photos saying, is this your father's work? Or, uh, I have this piece, but it's coming apart. How do I fix it? You know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suspect when the pieces really start to, I mean, we've sold some for some pretty good prices, but when they really start to become known in that price range, I suspect some will come out of the woodwork in auctions. Unfortunately, auctions, you know, there's a love-hate relationship with auctions because they control a lot of the market. And people won't take something seriously of an artist until it sells for a good price in auction. And unfortunately, my father had three or four pieces that slipped through the cracks before I started this project including a major piece this size, which was probably owned by John Kluge, and it sold for like 1800 bucks or something. I would have bought it in a minute. I mean, uh, and, um, and so, and a couple other smaller pieces sold for just a few hundred dollars. One, uh, two of them went to the NAMM Arts Foundation, so I'm very happy about that, because that became part of that permanent collection. And, uh, and of course, they loved my father's work and had written about it. And so, uh, but because those auction, rec are, they're on record for those prices, it makes it very, very difficult sometimes because first thing people do mm -hmm. is when they want to check about the price is they look at auction records. Mm -hmm. So this is a huge challenge. And of course, a lot of the, uh, the famous modern artists that were all household names now, uh, they, a lot of those pieces went to auction early on and that's how they became more known because back then the auction houses had shills that were bidding. And so they bid up those pieces. In fact, one show, I think it was at the Martha Jackson Gallery of de Kooning, she bought the whole show herself. She bought the entire show. Mm -hmm. And um, and those pieces, you know, ended up some of them in auction and stuff, and that's how they drove the prices up. And so it's a little more difficult to do that now. It can still be done, and people still do it, um, but it's against the law. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a little tricky. So I, I'm not quite sure how to handle it. I thought about putting a small piece or two and seeing if we can but I'm gonna wait because the museums are picking up on the pieces now and I'd rather, I'm, I'm just be happy if they'd be seen by the public. So they'd be in permanent collections and be seen, which is one of the 
the questions I ask the museums, I have, I have to know what they intend to do with the work. I don't want it just going to storage. Mm -hmm. So they have to commit to showing it a certain amount of time, you know, exhibiting it, uh, having it on their website. There has to be some commitments on their part mm -hmm. in order to have the work. Is that vertical or do they actually sign something? Uh, that's, uh, well, I can't control when the, when the Arts Foundation gave pieces, I can't really control that. But when I want to supplement, then that's when I can control it. And so we're working that out with a couple of museums now, the Philadelphia Art Museum is one of them. Mostly just on the relationship, if you trust them. You yes, it's a relationship type of thing, but I mean, uh, it's written, so it'll be, in, it'll be either email or letter or whatever, it's in, it's in writing. You can't, you know, you can't control these types of things, even if you had it in writing, you can't really control it, but you can get them to think about it and to understand the value and, and, and what it is we expect from these institutions when they have collections. I don't want to donate something and then have them give it away or have them put it in auction. <laughs> or no, you know, that's not the point. The point is to have it shown to the public, have it seen by the public. Lawrence, did yeah. your dad keep extensive records or documentation or do you have some sort of uh, reference to uh, build on for finding pieces? Oh yeah, uh, yeah, all the, all the major pieces, uh, like the architectural uh, installations have been uh, identified. The ones I've been trying to find are these doors and stuff, which have been more difficult to find. Um, and so, yeah, I pretty much located most of that kind of stuff. Um, and so, uh, you know, I mean, I'm open to see what comes up. I mean, if things come up in auction, I'll be bidding on them mm -hmm. because I love my father's work and, and I, I think it, it deserves a more notoriety and to be seen by more people. Does he sign his, does, does he sign his work? Yeah, uh, large pieces like this are always signed on the back mm -hmm. in the title. A lot of these will have um, some. Some of them will have labels from the gallery that have the title typed on it. Um, but there was a lot of work that never got mounted, and so that was something that I've done. So a lot of work, like uh, even this piece here, this was never mounted. Wait, no, excuse me. This is on original mounting. The piece here that's framed that was never mounted before. And so I mounted that so no one has no signature. Now he did experiment for a while where he would sign it in the enamel in the corner if it had an area where he could, he would scratch it. And, and I have some that are signed that way. Um, but I, what I've done for the pieces that were not signed that I've mounted myself, I've got a label that goes on, they have an inventory number and it has a label which has a signature on it. Uh, and, uh, and that gets glued to the back of the piece and then if that gets framed and has paper, it gets glued to the back of the paper as well. So that way it keeps a record of anybody has it. And they get, a, of course, a document from me that comes from the estate. So. These are actually great investment pieces. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because the four museums really, you know, they're in the museums. Yeah, um, I mean, all my parents' person. peers, their pieces sell for millions of dollars. In right. fact, Jasper Johns and Bob Rushing were very good friends of my mother. And one, I know Jack had a hard time getting in a creative headspace, knowing that whatever he created could sell for like $2 million. I mean, how, it's just a lot of pressure. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, maybe some artists don't have a problem with that, but he was having a hard time with it. He, yeah. he expressed that to my mother. And, um, but a lot of the most, I mean, there were like, uh, a lot of big influence on me was sculptor John Chamberlain. I mean, he was a good friend of the family's. And I would babysit for his kids, and so I'd go out and I'd watch him building these automobile part sculptures, which are some of my all-time favorite sculptures. And uh, his work has influenced my photography because I take photography similar to his sculpture. And I, and I create a print out of that, uh, which looks sculptural or you know abstract, but it's, it's really influenced by, by John Chamberlain's work. And um, another uh, artist that made sculptures for the community I grew up in was uh, Mark DeSuvero. Mark, uh, I don't know if you're aware, but he made these uh, kinetic sculptures that, was, that could mm -hmm. swing. Well, he actually literally made a swing for us kids. You know, the ball, <laughs> metal came down and had two tires on it. And we would swing, turn it around, and I had pictures of my parents swinging on it, right? Of course, it's in the museum now, and it's tied down, and you're not allowed to swing it in the museum. But those, he made those for us kids to play on. I mean, we, we played on them. And um, there were a lot of artists I, I grew up around that influence. I, I, I'd say out of my... Out of that genre, de Kooning was one of my favorites. Uh, Deven Korn, who's on the West Coast, my uncle John was known, was part, one of the Sausalito Six of the Abstract School of Expressionism, the San Francisco Abstract School of Expressionism. 
and he was with Deepen Corn and Bob Dell and um, uh, uh, my mind's going blank. But anyway, they they did a series of prints one time where they wanted to make art affordable, and so they each donated like two or three prints and it went to a little folio and they sold it for a dollar. I have one. I actually should have bought it, but it was about my uncle John's. It's nothing about my father. But um, uh, so he was part of that, and Deepen Corn was another artist. I, But uh, again, as a child, the most impressive thing about growing up on that community was the woods and the creek. I spent all day on that creek. And I was like, you know, I was mesmerized by what was going on underneath the rocks. Like you pull up a rock and there'd be salamanders and crayfish. And, you know, I mean, I just, I would sometimes just sit and watch ants like for an hour or two and watch ants, all the things you're doing, this microcosm of things going on. And this is, You'll see this influence in my own photography work, where I try to extract something out of the environment, whether it's urban or nature or whatever, and I create where you see patterns and forms and ideas, but they're, they're, it's done photographically rather than painted. Now, sometimes I wish I could paint some of those, but I'm not that good of a painter. <laughs> Maybe one day, I don't know. But anyway, so, um, so, so growing up on that community, even though, yes, I got the influence of all those artists and the, and the you know, they weren't just artists, by the way. They were filmmakers, uh, they were uh, uh, musicians, uh, dancers. Uh, I mean, John Cage lived on community. His, his partner, Merce Cunningham, was a you know, famous dancer. And we would go to these shows. I mean, they did a lot of experimental stuff. Like, they, uh, they did a show one time where they had these sensors uh, on the stage when you got close to, what they called, uh, uh, what are the name? When you go, they make noise and feedback when you get, when you get close to them. Mm -hmm. And so they set the stage up with these, and so when the dancers get close to them, they would, you know, make these noises and, you know, be part of the exhibit. And, you know, John Cage was famous. He's probably the father of avant-garde in the United States. And he was also, he was a, he was a composer, he was, a, he was an author, and he wrote a book called Silence. But he's most famous for his piano piece, where he came out and he sat in front of the piano for 20 minutes in silence. Mm -hmm. And of course, what the, what the, what was the concert was people coughing, people getting up and leaving, people, you know, I mean, you know, like people wondering what's going on. That was, it was a performance art. Again, it was like that stuff that I, as a kid, I didn't appreciate so much. I'm saying, well, where's the art? You composed a piece that was 500 years long yes. or something, and it just changed notes. It's being played in an organ <laughs> in a church somewhere, and it was going since the 90s, and a note just changed. Oh yeah, I didn't. I wasn't aware yeah. of that. <laughs> I wasn't aware of that. Uh, but there were other composers. David Tudor lived on the land, and there was, a, there was a. I mean, back then, and my mother described this to me. She says back then it wasn't like painters over here and you know musicians over here. That New York art scene was just everybody together. I mean, I remember we used to go see a lot of theater. The paper bag players, Remy Charlotte, who ended up writing a lot of children's books. Was a good friend of the family. And they had a, 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 a group of, a troupe called the, the Paper Bag Players. And they had, and the reason, because they'd make these giant costumes out of big bags and they had cutouts and they did theater. Kind of like, uh, what's that theater group in San Francisco that's pretty famous? They did a lot of outdoor theater. The Mime Troupe, they did a lot of outdoor theater. Those Paper Bag Players are like that. So, I mean, there were a lot of, I mean, poets, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of authors and, uh, and fam pretty famous people. And now they're famous, I mean, back then. Maybe not so much, but. Here's a book in your childhood. Huh? Here's a book in your childhood. Yeah, I guess I better hurry up and write it because my childhood, I'm, I'm getting old up there myself. Gosh. Super cool, man. Yeah, yeah. amazing. Yeah. Incredible. Mm. Well, really, I really thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Morris. It's been really wonderful.